Prove your own self, know ye not your own self. How that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest through we as reprobates. I have discovered that many of us do not like to go to the doctors for checkups. And it can be for various reasons. One reason I found is because we don't want to find out what might be. So we keep putting it off. I'm 49 years young, and I'm noticing that my eyes are a little dim. My legs hurt at times, my back aches, my knees are stiff. I'm more forgetful, and some other stuff is going on. Some of it comes with aging, but with other things I need to see a doctor. And at times I try to diagnose myself. And so we keep putting off until the need is great. And no matter how many times family members, husbands, wives, children, and friends, even correspondents from the doctor's office telling us it's time for your yearly exam, we won't go. We'll make excuses not understanding that these ailments we are having have been this way for a long time. Understand that all ailments start on the inside long before the manifest on the outside. People began to see the manifestation of our ailments they talk to us, they tell us, yet we won't heed to the one. So it is with our spiritual walk. We have some ailments going on in the inside of us that has begun to manifest on the outside that's causing us to limp, causing us not to see. And it's just not that man can see it, but God sees it. How do we know God sees it? Well, if you were at Founders Day, I uh, heard the bishop preach, uh, where is the lamb in our worship? Last week we were here, we heard that it's time to get loose. And with all those topics being said, that lets me know that something is wrong. We might be in the church, we might be saved, no matter what your position is, we still need to be cleansed. We still need to hear from God. We still need to go on that part of will, part of will, and be the clay that God can mold and shape us. And if I had to leave you with a thought on this morning, I would say, it's time for a spiritual examination. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we come to you once again, Lord, saying thank you. Thank you, O oh God, for this opportunity, this privilege, O oh God, to stand before a great cloud of people, O oh God. Lord, I ask now that you sit me down, God, that you go forth. I can't go unless you send the anointing, O oh God. Lord, I ask, O oh God, that you just... Keep me focused on you and your word. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, for you are my strength and my redeemer. My soul says amen. amen. It's time for a spiritual examination. Here in 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, we find Paul writing to the Corinthian church for the third time concerning their unrepented sins. He says, I'm coming to you for the third time. In the, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I tell you before and I foretell you as if I were present the second time. And be absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. What is he saying? We had some uh, facetious groups inside the church. You had some immoral groups inside the church. You had some rebellious folks inside the church. So Paul had to come and set the tone and, and help folks change their mind and the things and the ways of God. Paul is addressing their conduct, their behavior, and unrepentant sins. The two or three witnesses here are not different people, but the different visits he made to Corinthian church. Each separate visit, his teachings to them during those visits stood as a witness to those who failed to receive correction. He says, I told you before and I'm telling you in advance, as if I was there, but I am not. When I arrive and things haven't changed, I will not spare or hold back from unre unrepentant sinners. And I understand that his actions could be confronting and com um, publicly denouncing their behavior, exercising church discipline by calling them out before the church leaders or excommunicating them from the church. Understand that all what is going on in the Corinthian church is going on in all or most churches today. A lot of times it's the leaders whose conduct is called into question. The second issue is that I find that we won't confront what's going on, we just justify it or pick and choose who should be confronted. We don't want to discipline folk or ask them to leave 
for fear their whole family might leave the church. The church is not doing anything out of order for exercise and discipline, confronting issues of misconduct or even excommunicating persons from the church for this in the word. If you check out Matthew 18, 15 to 17, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8, and 2 Corinthians 2, 5 and 11 will let you know that it's in the word of God that folks inside the church can be disciplined. We wonder why the church isn't growing like it should. Understand that it is taking such actions, it should not be out of malice, but that the church might be in harmony. Church discipline should seek restoration. Two mistakes in the church discipline should be avoided. Being too lenient and not correcting mistakes, or being too harsh and not forgiving. There's a time to confront and a time to comfort. Verse 3 goes on, Paul goes on and says, Since you seek proof of Christ speaking in me, which toward you is not weak, but is mighty in you. But though he was crucified through weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we are also weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Here's the reason why Paul cannot spare them. They are actually seeking a proof of Christ speaking in Paul. Some of them at Corinth were questioning Paul's apostleship, his authority. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul speaking, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? There was evidence that lives had changed in Corinthians, and it was God using Paul. It was people seeking proof of what Paul was saying. Paul is saying, if things are right in you, you would find proof of Christ speaking in me to you. I'm going to make a scenario of the bishop. And he's been here for 18, 19 years. He preaches the gospel. He teaches the gospel. He bends over backwards. He helps everybody that he possibly can. And then we turn around and it's congregate members, whether we're in the pulpit, whether we're in leadership positions, whether we're just pew sitters, and we want to question the pastor of the things that he requires for us or asks us to do. So what he's saying, in other words, is that uh, lives have got changed in here. God has freed me, and I'm speaking to you, and because we're not on the same page, how is it that what I'm saying to you, you don't understand? The church, the body of believers, have a problem with authority. We have to be careful in questioning the authority of the man or the woman sent, anointed and appointed by God. Rejection of Paul meant rejection of Christ. When we reject the teachings, the corrections, and rebel against authority, we are not rejecting God's servants, teachings, or reproof, but Christ. And I discovered that I'm a question asker, and, and I like to ask a lot of questions. And sometimes people don't like you to question them because they, they, they're trying to figure out what your motives is. You're trying to, you know, show me off that I don't know what it is that I'm talking about. But every now and again, we need to ask questions to our leadership, but ask it in a way, in, in, in an act of humility. Not that you know everything and the person don't know nothing. Amen. See, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. It's how you present what it is that you need to know. Amen. Paul explained that he was weak but powerful. Although he was crucified in weakness when he, I'm sorry. Paul explained that he was modeling his behavior after the Savior. Jesus is not weak but powerful. Although he was crucified in weakness when he rose early Sunday morning, he got up with all power. The description that Paul uses of the crucifixion speaks to the determination of setting us free from sin. Christ and his crucifixion appeared as only a weak and helpless man, but his resurrection and life showed his divine power. Jesus is alive by power, and while the apostles are not perfect like Jesus, they will be strengthened by Jesus. Understand that that man and that woman sent by God, no matter how much you don't like them, no matter how much the, the world might think about them, whatever, God still anointed them, appointed them, right. and it down for you that you might grow in him. Paul goes on in verse 5, he said, examine yourself whether you are truly in the faith. Prove your own self. Know you're not your own self, how Jesus is in you, except you be reprobates. Reprobates signifies those who have been tried and found warning. Well, I had to look at that word. What does the warning mean? That you're never satisfied. 
No matter where you go, left, right, up, down, south, west, east, or north, you're still in a place of mourning. And in other words, prove your own self, test your own scenario, the next sincerity. The question here must be addressed. Were these rebellious sinners, genuine believers, were they truly in the faith? Paul is asking them honestly, examine their own lives to determine if they are in the faith. Yeah. The word examine in the Greek is dakem mazeti. Yeah. It means to test, prove, approve. Demonstrate to be genuine. Paul here is talking about your relationship with God. Yeah. Our faith in God. Where does our relationship stand with God? Yeah. And that's a question that only you can answer yourself. Where is your relationship on this day with God? If God calls you home or had to have you to stand up before him, what would he say to you about your relationship to him? In other words, we, Paul was looking for evidence. Do you express love for God, change behavior, and responsive to rebuke? Did you really experience the power of the Holy Spirit and the change in your life brought by Jesus? Do you really belong to the household of faith? Is Jesus Christ really in you? And for him to ask these questions, huh, he ain't listening to what you're saying, he watching what you're doing. I hear you profess and proclaim, but I'm watching what you're doing. I hear you say you love the Lord, but your actions are showing something different. Amen. Examine yourself on today. Paul was calling us today to examine ourselves to see if you are truly in the faith. Right. Understand that, that just as we need and get physical exams, we are urged to get spiritual exams as well. The process of self-examination. Examine yourselves, then prove yourselves. The word prove in scripture means both to prove and to approve. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be condemned in the world. Yes. This process of self-examination is based upon the self-same principles of which all examinations are held. Yes. First examine and then prove, as the man of science does, and then draws his generalization out of it. As the judge who collects the evidence and then gives his charge to the jury. As the medical man who finds out the symptoms and examines until he obtains a diagnosis of his case and then gives the prescription of the treatment. As the examiner who puts his questions and then decides upon the classification of the exam. We must get all the facts together as clearly as we can and then determine our classification in the sight of God. What did I just say? Folks probably saying, I don't know what you're talking about. You got some ailments that's going on in your life. It can be physical, it can be mental, it can be spiritual. And before the doctor can give you that prescription to help treat what's going on, he need to first examine you to find out what is really going on with you and us and me on the inside. That's right. We don't go to the doctors just to be going to the doctors. We go to the doctors because something is wrong. I may can't pinpoint what that thing is, you know, rather how, but I know that something is wrong and I need to go and get an examination. So this is what God is saying to us today. You say, you're in church, you profess and you proclaim that you know God, but your actions are saying something totally different of what it is that you are professing. To what this examination is directed, whether you be in the faith. Faith is a moral element, the spiritual atmosphere in and by which we have our being. Think about this, how sad is it that with all the preaching that we hear, with all the singing that we hear, and the school teaching, the faith has so little influence over us. That is what we should be examining ourselves about on today. Are we are truly in the faith? This is what Paul was saying to the Corinthian church. Are you truly in the faith? Well, preacher, I discovered what it takes for me to get an exam, and I'm going to the doctors because something is wrong, but I can't understand what's wrong. So I need some help with that answer, with that question. 
I know when I need a spiritual exam? You need a spiritual exam when you put your faith in man rather than God. Psalms 146.3 says, Put not your trust in prince, nor in the sons of man, in whom there is no help. What he's saying to you, there is no hope in man. I might rely on my husband, and he might rely on his wife, and you might rely on your kids, you might rely on your job, you might rely on your boo, you might rely on your money. But what God is saying to you, do not put your faith in those things, because it has no help for you. Amen. You need a spiritual exam when you manage to bring all your worldly materials in your bag to church and leave your Bible at home. The Bible is our basic instructions before we leave in this earth. This is our bread, our living water. This is our life that we should meditate day and on, at night on his word. But yet, we don't have our Bible. Yet, even when the pastor and the preachers are preaching, you don't have no Bible, you don't take no notes, you don't take nothing to reflect on throughout the week. Yeah. I find out once we leave church, all oh, hell begins to break loose. I don't care what's going on. It might be your kid, it might be your job, it might be something. But we need something on the inside, which is the word of God, that's going to keep us all You need a spiritual exam when you profess to be a believer in Christ, but you have hidden the light of Christ from the world. Matthew 5, 13 and 16 says, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. What sense does it make for us to be saved and don't nobody know it? What sense does it make to be saved and we ain't telling nobody absolutely nothing? We're supposed to be the salt. The salt adds flavor to the, to the, to the world, right? But if there's no salt then, then what are we doing? It's worth nothing. We might as well just step on it because it is not serving any purpose. God said, let your light so shine before men. You need a spiritual exam when you claim that you are a Christian while still holding on in your heart what somebody has done to you in your past. Colossians 3 and 13 says, Bear with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving one another as the Lord forgave you, you must also forgive. Must forgive. Like I tell you, we can't get loose, we can't get our lamb and our worship, huh? because we won't let go of some let stuff go. that has been changed.
I need a spiritual exam when we continue to live as the world does. Yes. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I was reading a story about Titus, and I think it's the first chapter around the 16th verse. Yes. Well, 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 Paul had sent, sent, sent Titus to, to the island of Crete to get the church and set the church in order. But Paul was the writer of Titus, and he was saying that they profess and they could proclaim that they love the Lord, but I'm looking at their lifestyle. I'm looking at how they live it. I'm looking at how they walk. How in the name of God did you say that you are a child of God and you live in any old kind of way? None of us are perfect. We already know that. We will not be perfect till we see Jesus. But at the end of the day, God requires holiness. He said, for I am Lord. And that's because he's holy and we need to be looking for holiness in our lives. We need a spiritual exam, but the things of the, of the world are more important than the things of God. When you have a bad attitude, your conduct, the character of our relationship with others, Philippians 1 27 says, only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that you stand fast in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Here Paul encourages the believers to fight side by side, not against one another, but instead united against the real opposition, which is Satan. And I stop by to tell the church, and we, we should already know this by now. We are fighting an unseen enemy. It's not the brother on the board. It's not the sister on the pew. It's not your husband. It's not your wife. It's not your kid. It's not your in-laws. And it's not the outlaws. But it is an unseen enemy. And his name is Satan. We can't win the war or the fight because we're fighting against one another. God wants us to come together and be unified. That we might fight together side by side. I need an exam when we don't fellowship regularly for worship, prayer, and Bible study. Help me, Holy Ghost. Hebrews 10 and 25. For the sake, not the assembly of yourselves as you see the day approaching. That's the coming of the Lord. In the meantime, we should be ready for worship, prayer, and Bible study. I can't understand why we as church folks say we say the sanctified, Bible baptized still with the Holy Ghost and going to heaven anyhow, but won't come to worship services, won't come to Bible study, won't come together and be unified to learn the things of the church that we might be equipped to do ministry. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So examine yourselves on today. And I understand that we got jobs and we got kids, Brother Carrie, and we do all what we do, but we still need to take time now to go up. That means that I need to prioritize my life for so a kingdom priority, not a worldly lifestyle. I made a promise to God when I got this job that I'm going to work, I'm going to pay my tithes, I'm going to do what I need to do. And on my off week when I don't get paid, I'm still going to have an offering to give to God, right? Not only am I going to have an offering to, 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 to give to God, but I'm going to have a word of life to yes. speak to the yes. saints of God. Yes. And the only way I'm going to get to this, I need to come and fellowship one with another. Iron sharp as iron. I need to be in the midst of my brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes. I, I can't sharpen myself by myself. I, I can't do that. Wow. I need somebody else to help sharpen me. Wow. So the only way I'm going to do it is I need to come to church. Yes, I need to sit up under the Word. Amen. I can't give nobody nothing because there's nothing on the inside. Amen. I can't give nothing out because there's nothing on the inside. That's a sad case for a saint of God. <laughs> Worship, prayer, Bible study. We need to come together. It's a must need in these days and these times that we come together. Now the question becomes, not only you can be honest about your examination, if any of these statements apply to you, then you need a spiritual examination. Even with the jobs and stuff that we have and it costs for us to be there 10 hours, 11 hours, 12 hours a day, whatever the case may be. I, I told somebody uh, yesterday about, you know, they want to work a couple of jobs. And I hear people saying I need extra money, so I want to work a couple of jobs. 
all this different type of stuff. But at the end of the day, God said, be a good steward over your finances. If I be a good steward over my finances, I won't have to get no second or third job. Number one, I need to not live above my means. Even if I'm making $80,000 a year, I said, I have $60,000 instead of $80,000. Hopefully that, then guess what? Your life, gets, your life gets better. I ain't tired. I ain't angry. You know, I'm doing what God has called me to do. A many of men and women inside the church alone is struggling because they're always looking for more. That's that warning that I'm talking about. Always looking for more and looking for more. And what I discovered is, right, the more I try to work, the more money I try to get, my pocket got a hole in it. Nothing stays in my pocket. Nothing stays in my pocket. I need to be a good money manager over my finances. I remember coming into to the rehab and I, and I, I was staying at the shelter and I was only getting $49 a month. That was it. Well, number one, I had a local habit. Okay? I had a cigarette habit. Uh, that, that was $15 right there. And then Bruce got said, you got to give $10 to the church. Well, he done lost his mind. But I got to get mine. But what he explained to me is that you just tied off that $49. If you give the $5, I promise you, your life will get better. You might not have everything you want, but your life will get better. Jesus Christ, I can't stop that $5. God has been good. He's been good. I had to come back to that because it was in the forefront of my mind. Paul affirmed his 
assurance with the Lord, Paul did not ask the folk at Corinth to do something he had not done himself. Paul expressed the idea that he wanted them to pass the test. Paul held the truth as a standard by which all things must be judged. Paul had high hopes for them. It's not measuring your standards against yourself and your standards against man and anybody else, but your standards against God. And with God, God has placed leaders over us to lead us, teach us, and correct. They have high hopes and want the best for us, that we may grow into mature believers, not just profess our faith or begin attending church, but to see us mature in our faith. When we reject the governing authority God has sent to us, it is as if we are rejecting Christ himself. A lot of times we think we are rejecting Bishop Scott, the leaders, the ministers, and our leadership and all that different type of stuff. But we are rejecting Christ. What you're saying is, and I can't say it, but I'm going to say it this way. Forget you, God. Not right now, God. I got a life to live, God. I don't have time for this, God. But could you bless me in the midst of it, God? The devil is a liar on today. It is well known that churches struggle and have weaknesses in the body of Christ. But God has also worked powerfully in the lives of his people and used them mightily. And you can just take a look at Trinity Church. And if you sit down and talk to some of the members and the folks that have been here for some time, they went through hell and back. God brought them out, he brought them up, he turned them around and put their feet on a solid ground. And when he did what he did, he began to use these people mightily. I go back, I'm preaching the gospel. Who would have thought, because I didn't think I was going to be in that no church, not in church. I bet you 